Today is the 12th of August, 2011. I am at the Wesley Healthcare Center in Saratoga Springs, New York. To today we're interviewing Dr. Leo Hoagie. My name is Wayne Clark. I'm with the New York State Military Museum here in Saratoga Springs. Uh, Dr. Hoagie, for the record, would you please state your full name and your date and place of birth, please? Leo John Hoagie, Jr. I was born in Saratoga Springs on November the 23rd, 1915. Did you attend school in Saratoga? Yes, I attended grammar school, number four school, and then high school, and my classmates, uh, Judge Michael Eastwood, Michael Eastway was in my class, and I was president of the class, and so was, you see, and there was Bill, uh, for Nate Goldsmith, who had the restaurant on Pilot Street. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the Mother Goldsmith's restaurant. He also had uh, a restaurant on South Broadway, the uh, country gentleman. And so he was much into the restaurant business. And uh, I graduated from high school in 1933, the class of 33. Mm -hmm. And then when I graduated, uh, my good friend Judge Michael Sweeney went to law school and then eventually became associated in the office with a, a, a Jim Larry, who was a, a, a very important man in Saratoga. He owned half of Saratoga, and Doc Bruno on the other half. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was the class of 1933, Mike, uh, Bill Ford, Mike Sweeney, and the rest of us. When I was a junior in high school, because I was very tall, mm -hmm. and I uh, played basketball, and one weekend the coach took us on a trip, a camping trip outside, and there was a lot of junk food that we were eating, and during the course of the weekend, I developed a severe pain in my abdomen. Uh -huh. There was no vomit, but severe pain, and so I called the, uh, so the coach, took me to my home, and uh, my parents, both my, my father was chief engineer at Skidmore, and my mother was an assistant dietitian, and they took me to, my mother took me to, back to G. Scott Town, on Fellow Street, and he said, oh, you just got a little bit of abdominal pain, you'll be all right. So anyway, that was a weekend, and suddenly I, this pain got kept getting worse. We lived in 113 Lincoln Avenue near the Five Points. And uh, I called, telephone, I was scared one to speak with my mother. And I said, I can't take this pain anymore. I, I'm not vomiting, but I got severe pain in my abdomen. So she said, that's all right, we'll, we'll send a taxi for you. Not an ambulance, a taxi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the taxi arrived, it was driven by John Bernardo. And he had a cute little hat cap on. I managed to get dressed, and he took me down Lincoln Avenue, Railroad Place, Circular Street, Spring Street, Broadway, and we came to the hospital. And uh, then there was a little difficulty getting in because my mother uh, had come from Skidmore. But anyway, I was admitted, and it turned out that I had a perforated appendix. And there were, in those days, there was no antibiotic, mm -hmm. and so uh, it was most usually you died. Because a good friend of mine, Woodward, played basketball too, and he had died. So anyway, I uh, they operated, and there's a big scar here, and uh, uh, they had a rubber tube in to get the pus out of the back of the peritoneum. And it, is that too much detail? No, that's oh, fine. So <laughs> the, the detail. He, and I think it was the second, now the hospital didn't have anesthetists at that time training them, but they, when you were on duty, why you, uh, the medical center, you gave the anesthesia. So Joe, Dr. Joe Carly had given the anesthesia that day. He came in a couple of days after I'd been operated on, and he said, boy, it took a lot of ease to knock you out, because I was a big kid even in those uh -huh. days, you know. And so he said, what are you going to do now? I said, well, I think I'm going to graduate from high school. And he said, but after that, I said, I have no idea. These are depression days. 
Mm-hmm. You know, rice and beans were their normal means for me. Meal for me. So, I, so he said, no, listen, I'm going to give you a letter, and when you're feeling better, you take us out to Babe Krause in Hobart College in Geneva, New York, and he, he'll take care of you. Now, my parents are both working seven days a week. Mm-hmm. They're not going to drive me out to Geneva. But there was a good friend of mine, Joe Wheatley, who came from England, and he swam with the New York Athletic Club, held a quarter mile world championship. And he was he had married a girl from Greenville, Helen Dre. And so I said, hey, Joe, would you drive me out to Hobart? Yeah, sure. So we drove out. And when we arrived on campus, he said, Where's the swimming pool? I said, I'm not interested in the swimming pool. <laughs> I, I gotta see the coach, Coach Babe Krause. So we found Babe Krause and I gave my the letter from Joe Kiley. And I got a basketball scholarship for years. And wow. that's how I got in college. Mm-hmm. And of course, well, it was great in college. I was freshman team, of course, in varsity. I was captain of the varsity team, too. And then after the graduating college in 1937, I did get a job working at the spa pool as a guard. That was a beautiful job. Very nice. The atmosphere was nice. And flowers and all. Me and the people, uh, Ben Crosby and Sophie Tucker and all these performers from various clubs. And so it was a really great job. But uh, after that, it's still depression days mm-hmm. and, and things are tough and tight. So uh, I get a job working in Puerto Rico through a friend of mine who had been down there. He'd come back to go to school. And I had had some friends in high school but uh, no Spanish. And in those days, you did not fly to Puerto Rico. You, you took a ship down the Bull Line from New York. It took four days to mm-hmm. go from New York down to Manatee, Manatee, or uh, San Juan. And when I arrived there at the dock, the people that, the, the people that I was going to work for, he had a sugar, largest sugarcane plantation on the island. And so he had money, of course. But, uh, they did not speak English, and I did not speak Spanish. And so I'm here, coming from Saratoga, never been part of the South in New York City. Here I am in, down in the tropics, beautiful climate, you know, and marvelous. And uh, this was in San Juan, Air, uh, San Juan Port, where the ship came in. And then we drove by car over to Manatee, 30 to 5 miles west of San Juan. And that's where I lived for a year taking care of this boy. He was a spastic, and he had had a cerebral hemorrhage in the brain involving the motor area of the brain, so that every muscle in his body was involved, including mm-hmm. the eye muscle. And I'd be, have to feed him, and I'd be going to put some food in his mouth, and somebody would honk the horn, and I'd, oh, boom, and he'd jump and jerk, you know. Poor kid, I felt so sorry for him. Mm-hmm. But I developed a feeling for people that are disabled, and these people here, I, you know, I feel for them too. Anyway, when Enrique and I got along very well, being mentally though, he was sharp. Mm-hmm. He knew baseball scores better than us, scored it just as well as I did. And we would, I, I, we had a chauffeur to drive us, but I liked to drive. And I would be driving around the island. And we used to go to Comandante, uh, the, the racetrack in Puerto Rico, and five boxing matches. Sixto Escobar was a very good boxer in nearby village. And every Friday night they would have uh, boxing matches, and there was wooden creatures. But I noticed that there was chicken wire between the ring and here, because during the brisk excitement of the, of the fight, these, Port- these Puerto Ricans were drinking beer, and they would throw beer bottles. Oh, thanks. So that screen was up to catch the beer bottles. Mm-hmm. But that was kind of an interesting experience. And uh, so, uh, I enjoyed myself down there very well. I got the, the he, he was only 70 pounds, and I, I could carry him by my arm because he couldn't walk or do anything. Mm. And uh, we'd get into an ox cart, and, and the guy driving the ox cart would take us down to the beach, and I'd put him in the water, and he'd be kicking and splashing and enjoying himself, you know. And he had a black lab called Joe Lewis, because Joe Lewis was the big fighter in those, at those days. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, and then eventually I, uh, 
I get along real well. I've gotten to Puerto Rico, I get along very well with them too. As a matter of fact, even now, every once in a while, I get a call from Puerto Rico and they will ask, Hey, Lee, you're a member of the family. When are you going to come and visit us again? When are you coming to Puerto Rico? And of course, I'm not doing much traveling these days. So after that, while I was down there, I got I, I, I had applied to the University of Louisville uh, Medical School. Now Louisville, Kentucky, Saratoga, we're all interested in horse racing. Mm -hmm. And when you go in Louisville, no matter where you go, you go in an elevator and the guy's talking horses. Horses, horses, horses. So I felt like I was back home in Saratoga you now. So we got along very well there. And I did very well from there. And then on December the 7th, 1941, I was coming out one, one building to go to another, and the fellow said, what happened? You know what happened today? I said, what? He said, what happened at Pearl Harbor? They just, Japanese just bombed Pearl Harbor. Oh, oh. I'm going to have to go in the Army. I said, I don't want to go in the Army. I want to go in the Navy. So the next morning, I went down to the post office in Louisville, and uh, now, in medical, when I was playing ball in, in college, I was uh, 204. Mm -hmm. After a game, I'm 200. Look at all the back there. I was, I'm 6'5 and a quarter inch, so I'm sort of a tall guy, and that was my good weight. But in medical school, uh, no money, very little money. I didn't even banana, uh, I mean, I didn't, not bananas, but I was totally, uh, I was eating graham crackers and milk and stuff like that. And my weight went down from 204 to about 168. And when the medical corpsman was checking my weight, six, five and a quarter, and you better speak with the doctor. So I went over to speak with the doctor, and go out. And he said, uh, Lee, you got to eat more food. I said, no, but I, I've been, I'm willing to give a certain things, finances mainly. And uh, you got to eat more bananas, get more food, and come back in a few weeks, will you? I said, sure. So I went home, I tried to eat more, but I'm working out, you know, I get up at, I'm studying till four o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning for the exam. In medical school is tough. Mm -hmm. You gotta study, study, study. And I didn't think about food, at least in my words. The main thing is to pass these courses I was taking. So finally, after about three weeks, I think I gained two or three pounds, so I got to go in the Navy. This is the war coming mm -hmm. up. And I got to go in the Navy. I don't want that army. So I went back down to the post office again. This time I going to be tricky. Fortunately, the corpsman was a different corpsman. And I got on the scales. And he you know, checked my, my height. And I'm 5'10", 173 pounds. Welcome aboard, doctor. <laughs> so that's how I get in the Navy. And now, once, now once in the Navy, I had eggs and steak for breakfast. Uh -huh. You know, in the Navy, you do get, you get paid very well. Now, had you graduated from med school at that point? Oh, yeah. I was a graduate. Okay. Graduate. So, uh, I graduated from med school, and then, of course, joined the Navy mm -hmm. on November the 5th, 1942. Mm -hmm. And then, after my training, I was sent to, to, uh, to be with the Marines, mm -hmm. the amphibious training, Lido Beach, Long Island. I had 10 hospital corpsmen, and each hospital corpsman was issued a carbine rifle and taught how to use it. And I was issued a 45, and I could strip a 45 just as good as a Marine. And uh, so I was, that's my training. And eventually one time we took us down to the city to see what, what, what kind of a ship I'm going to be on. An LST, mm -hmm. a landing ship tank, a great, like a great big garage, and very show draft. And there's a lot of motion. And so we <coughs> go out, we go in, the corpsman, and my, my, I had uh, 10 hospital corpsmen, and we're in, in this thing, and we're going out, you know, we're going through Long Island Sound, and we come up by Boston. We thought we'd go in Boston, but instead we just kept going. Finally, we came to Halifax, and we then were forming up an 80 ship convoy. And while I was there, some of the Canadian doctors said, now we got some. Motion and sickness. You're going, to have, you're going to have a lot of motion in it. That LST with very short draft and uh, 
keep a record of this. He gave me, he gave me a couple of three big bottles of, of these capsules. They had scopolamine, atropine, and phenobarbital. And uh, let us know, keep a record, let us know how they, this works for motion sickness. This is before the days of driving me. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we show up, and it's for the ship, big 80 ship convoy. And of course, as soon as you get away from the shore, then there's a lot more motion. And everything was going. And one night I had been in, in the board room, and my son, another guy and I, we were walking along the deck. Some guys I'd give these pills to, was up to the good tub up above, and he was all this motion. He was, he was ill. <laughs> this splash all over the deck. I eventually threw the capitals overboard, but they didn't do anything. Wow. Scopolamine has been used for hundreds of years for motion sickness, but the only trouble is it blurs your, if you have too much, it blurs your vision, and that's not good. But uh, and if you don't take enough of it, it doesn't do any good. So anyway, can't get rid of those pills. And every once in a while we had to stop because of German submarines or this and that. And finally, this a big flotilla, we arrive over, and then ships start going different places. Then we, we opened the safe, in the, our safe, to find out where we were going to go to. And the Clyde, the Clyde, that's a river in Scotland. So anyway, we were pulled out and went up to the Irish Sea, and we went to the Clyde. And we got in there. Now, we've been to sea for probably over three weeks. And everybody's anxious to get to, get to uh, uh, the beach. But who's going to go on the beach? It's going to be the captain and the executive officer. And we have to sit and watch them. So here we are in Scotland after three weeks at sea with binoculars. Look, that's how we took our liberty with binoculars. And finally, the captain and the exec came back later on. They come aboard. And then we get underway again. And we get down to the Irish Sea, out into the channel. You, know, you never know where you're going in the Navy. You, know, you just go, go. And we pulled into Plymouth, Plymouth Harbor, in Queens Barracks. That was the part of the docking space where we went to. 11 o'clock at night. Now, everybody wants to go in Liberty. Why well, sit around? But we can't all go in Liberty. Some guys had to stay aboard to maintain a watch. <coughs> I didn't manage to go that night. So we're walking along the streets of Plymouth at 11 o'clock at night, which had been bombed. And you could smell the cordite. And all the bombs. Boy, the Germans really blasted that place. Pillars were down, and, was a mess. and every once in a while, it's black, black. And so here, these somebody comes down the street, and you hear the clicking again. The British had metal in their soul, and they click and they and they stop and give you a salute, you know, once in a while. And we finally ended up. Well, that's how it, as far as Plymouth goes. And then from Plymouth. Uh, we uh, eventually got into a, uh, well, my, my ship was 531, and I'm still on the 531. And we used to have to patrol on in the channel at night sometimes, and sometimes in the morning. And one particular day we're out. Now, we did, along the coast there, England, they have uh, lights. be sure to it's a show the area or something like that. And so as we're going, now we have radar, so we're scanning all the while. If any ships or anything else, we can see it. So we go by, we see the, these buoys, but the, as soon as we get by the buoy, there's a, a German shell boat there. It comes out and puts a torpedo in the stern of my boat and blows the thing up and it sinks. And a lot of my buddies were sunk. But I, I may survive. And then I would put onto another LSD, mm -hmm. LSD 371. The 531 was sunk. And I'm on the 371. And this is the one that I'm going to go for D Day. So, anyway, now that we thought that the Germans were going to uh, use gas, so they would put us in a big closet hut, <coughs> filled up with gas, and we had an astronaut stay in there for a certain length of time, and then some guy would shout, All masks off! And the mask would come off, and then of course you got to get the hell out of there as fast as you can, you know, just to see what, how we react to uh -huh. all this stuff. See? And so that was kind of exciting. Well, I did have a little time off, and one time I was there in Floyd Cornwall, that's near the western part of England, 
and uh, I was having coffee with a couple of Navy guys, and uh, a gal comes in with HMS on her cap, and uh, she had Women's Royal Naval Service. Would you have a cup of coffee with us? So she, she sat down and had the coffee, and I noticed that her fingers were stained brown. I said, you shouldn't smoke those players' cigarettes. When British cigarettes make your fingers go, you should smoke Chesterfield. I'm encouraging you. you get with it. So anyway, <laughs> I always, in my raincoat pocket, every time I came into Foy, I seemed to be coming into Foy real often. And I bought a carton of Chesterfield in my raincoat pocket to give to her. And I got to know this girl, Shayla Scott, real well. And we used to take walks sometimes. And over, uh, if you ever go to England, go in the springtime because it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And it's over, overlooking the channel, you know. And uh, every once in a while she looked at her watch. Oh, she said, I got, I got a date. She had a date with some other baby guys. Eh? But anyway, that didn't bother me. But we got along real well. Now she was in security and she knew when my ship was leaving, but she wouldn't tell me. But she gave me this picture. It's in my wallet. I showed it to you. Mm -hmm. And, and then she said to my darling Lee and so on. So I, I carried that always. And then I shoved off and we landed. At 5.30 in the morning, June the 6th, 1944, Normandy Beach. And the AH was skimming across the roof. And I know we're going to get hit because the skin of the analysis says a quarter inch. You can poke holes in the ship very easily. Mm -hmm. And so I know we we get hit, we're going to go down or at least take out a lot of water. So, uh, but I would, you know, when it, of course, after 5.30, I'm all ready. Now, when the ship goes, because I'm a doctor, so I can go up on the bridge. I'm up on the bridge. And when the ship goes down, my plan is this. You always have to have a plan. So I have to have a plan. And this is it. When the ship goes down, I'm going to swim to the beach. I'm going to swim to the north. So anyway, we did get hit. So we were all Off our starboard bow, there's a destroyer escort bridge. And shoot up a shore bow. Shoo, shoo, shoo. And then when she went out to a mine, and she was in such shoal water, she sank. When she sank, her stacks were still out of the water. And man, we picked up cash. Sailors were on the deck. We had compound fractures. We were busy, busy people. Mm -hmm. uh, were you the only doctor on, on board the ship? Yeah, I was the only doctor. Mm -hmm. And uh, eventually, uh, we picked up cash from the beach. And then uh, it was uh, these ten, ten, ten hospital cars doing a good job. And the, uh, see that, well, all of them, we pick up these, and we, see, we take care of the wound. One guy had put his fatty up in the air and uh, got shot, a bullet into his buttocks, mm. and took part of his pants, too. And you had to pick all that stuff out and clean the wounds and splints and give them more feed for pain. And then if the blood pressure was low, have to give them IV solutions to maintain the blood pressure and all the routine care that you can ordinarily give any patient that's, that's wounded. Treating these guys, they're all laying out. And the LLC is like a big garage. And it's a, we have these stretches in all throughout the place. And then we take them back to England for definitive therapy. And then when that is right, then we're ready for another. So we go in for the second trip. Mm -hmm. We'll pick up more, same thing. It hadn't changed too much, although the first trip was the worst. And then we pick up more cows and come back. Now, were you taking fire when you were going in? The, sec the first one, 80 I just got through telling you, 88s, the Germans were firing 88s at us. Boom, boom, boom. And it was at night, 5.30 in the morning. And the 88s were coming on each side of it. And that's what I said. If uh, I was all prepared, that when that one of those 88s hits us, it's going to mm -hmm. go down quick. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to swim to the beach. But we did not get hit. And we made it and picked up casualties from the air, Richard, to, uh, from the air trip. So anyway, we got back. And now I'm on the next trip. Now I'm on my second trip into the beach now. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't quite as bad, but it was still, they were still firing at us. And uh, so, uh, they, but while I'm, 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 after the second trip, I'm back at, at uh, Portsmouth Harbor, England. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, on the after end of the LLC, is a three inch gun dump. And I'm up there writing a letter home to my parents in Saratoga Spring. And the sailor comes up, Hoagie, captain wants to see you. I said, yes, sir. So I went in to see the captain. And he said, Hoagie, you got over 
where she got Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima, and the English shout, that's a woman in the Pacific someplace. But she goes, so my tent hospital called and I got orders to go to Iwo Jima. So we left the ship, then we get on a train, and we ride up to north, and we don't know where the hell we're going. We're going up to northern England. Every once in a while we'd stop, and the English ladies would be serious, tea, I like, I like tea. You know. So anyway, and then we came up to, up on the Clyde, and we saw the Queen Elizabeth. Oh, we're going back at the Queen Elizabeth. That looks like a good trip there. Man, we never got near the Queen Elizabeth. It took us back down to get to Liverpool, and we got on another ship, which took us back to the States. So it's a long, long trip. Finally, I got back to the States, and I got 10 days leave. So, uh, and did I tell you about Joe Wheatley? You remember Joe? Well, I knew a, a friend of mine in Saratoga. He had come from England, and uh, he was married in a uh, British, uh, certain American girl. And he was living near Saratoga. And of course, I like to swim, so I knew him real well. So he said, you got orders to go out to, out to the Pacific, is he? Yeah. He said, now, when you go out there, you're bound to go to the Pearl Harbor, or Honolulu. And a good friend of mine is Duke Hanamaku. And he and I used to swim. He held five gold medals, Duke Hanamaku. He said, go, be sure to go and see him now, will you? Mm -hmm. I said, sure. I'm, I'm sure we'll get into Pearl sometime. And sure enough, now when I got into the Pacific, I was assigned to the USS Atlanta, CL-104, and we operated with Admiral Hall's the Fast Carry Task Force 38.1, and uh, for those island programs. And sure enough, I did what I did into Pearl. So I did what I had to do in Pearl, and then I went to the sheriff's office with a big long hallway like I identified myself as the secretary. And I said, may I speak with the Duke of Animal too? She said, just a moment, please. And eventually, out of the end of this hall came a great big guy with a great shock of gray hair, very stern looking. And he came up to me, and I said, Duke, a uh, good friend of Joe Wheatley sends his best regards to you. Did you know Joe Wheatley? Oh, yeah, I, I, I know him real well. Wow, man, what are you doing for lunch? I said, nothing. Oh, I, oh, come on. He took me out of here at Canoe Club. And while we were eating our food, he was telling me about poi and toy, all those uh, island foods. At the end of the lunch time, he said, uh, have you ever been on a surfboard? I said, no, I've never been on a surfboard. I love to swim. I like, I, I like to swim. I was a guard at Victoria Pool, as mm -hmm. I told you. So anyway, uh, hey, well, let's go. So he taught me to ride a surfboard. So I knew I had and you paddle out, and when you see a big one coming, you get up on your knees and legs and, up, and go in. And I, I picked that up, it was fun. It was really great, it was a great sport. So I had enough for, for an hour or two of that, and, and no problem at all. And the conclusion, that little surfboard thing, he said, now Lee, when you come back into Pearl, I'm going to give you my card, and you can be my guest. Man, I'm the guest at the Duke of Hanuma, cool. So I, I still say this card. I ordered to carry it with me, but I don't have it with me now. So anyway, uh, that, so I left, and then went back in, we went out there for those island things, shore bombardments, and, but the worst one was Okinawa. Mm -hmm. We were out there in Okinawa, and I, I told you this story before, you've heard me tell it, but the Japanese kamikaze were coming like chrysanthemum all around, boom, boom, and they shot up 30 of our ships. And we had 9,700 Navy casualties. That was a bad one. That was a bad one for us. And that must have shook up President Truman, too, because they realized he's going to be planning to invade Japan. But if we're having, if we lose 9,000, we're going to have problems. So he drove back to life. Nagasaki, Hiroshima, we, sh we killed 90,000 Japanese people. And of course, then it was all the war is over. The war is over. They salute, they resist, they were, they were beat. And then the, the Victoria, the victory thing was held on one of our ships, and I think it was that, couldn't have been in Arizona because that was on the bottom of the Pearl. But anyway, so that was, uh, so the war is over now. Was there a lot of celebration aboard your ship? Not too, too much. Uh, mm -hmm. Not too much. It was, uh, it was, it was 
it's just a kind of a routine thing. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, every Sunday we had a religious service, and uh, we had an organ, a little some medical or musical type of thing, and we had a, a priest, a, a chaplain, Catholic chaplain. He was a good guy, and uh, so. But anyway, so now the war is over. Near the end of the war, a Japanese torpedo plane put a torpedo into the port stern of the Pennsylvania as a battleship and blew a 40-foot hole, a great big hole, but it survived and managed to get it down to Guam and they filled it with concrete and says the war is over and it's got to go back to the States. Of all the ships out there, my ship was to escort the Pennsylvania back to the States. Of great duty, <laughs> and then every number of hours or so, we had to stop, put divers over to be sure that the concrete was holding pretty well. And that, in fact, was a long, long, tedious trip back to the West Coast. And we were stationed on the West Coast for a while. Then I was on the East Coast, and one day I get a letter from Sheila Scott, it said I will be arriving in New York City on the on the. the what was the name of that? Well, it, was a, it was a Swedish ship, the Gripsol. Mm -hmm. And uh, on May the 10th, 1946, I'll be sure to be right. So I, I'm down in New York on that day, and I went aboard the Gripsol when it came in. Now, were you still in the Navy or were you discharged? Oh, I'm still in the Navy, sure. <laughs> this is wars going on. Wars going on. When we blasted those torpedoes, that didn't end the war. It just ended with Japan. We still were fighting Germany. So uh, I went aboard, hey, Sheila. And she was with a couple of other ladies. And I said, well, uh, oh, good to see you, Sheila. And uh, she said, and she immediately, within a minute, she turned and looked at me straight out. Now, if you've changed your mind, she said, I could go back in the ship. Go back, go ahead and grab it, come on, let's go. I put her in my car, and we drove up to Saratoga, and we got, I, we got married at my parents' house on Church Street. And that was a big affair. I guess we got pictures, you see the pictures of it. So anyway, and she was a great lady, Sheila, Sheila Scott. And uh, she was a great and strong lady, but gentle, and very supportive of me. Mm -hmm. And of course, and after the after that war, I ended up in the old time, and we're up here with all the time in Coral Laboratory. That was a high point. I'm still Navy now, mm -hmm. in the reserve. Okay. And uh, so now, did you maintain a <coughs> private practice? Well, no, no. Well, I had. I, well, right after the war, I was back here, mm -hmm. and for a little bit, and I did a little practice, but that was not for me. I'm the Navy, and I used to I'd be in the reserve, and I could attend the reserve me to Scotia Naval people. Or, or not on Long Island. And so, but this was good because these people, of course, Admiral Wicker was the father of the nuclear submarine. And radiation, it was a relatively new field at that time, although the Germans had been working at too for quite a while. And we had the Manhattan Project going on, President Roosevelt was initiated that mainly because of, of uh, Alfred the Steinmetz. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that was, uh, so then I'm in the reserve now and, uh, and working over there with the North Carolina Corps Lab. That was interesting because these fellows were great mathemat mathematicians, scientists, and physicists, and, uh, but very, very, most, the most intelligent people I ever spoke with and knew personally. I always remember one fellow, I was reading a little bit of history on the side and uh, he said, history is but accepted myths. History is but accepted myths. And I always thought about it. But I still like the Civil War and the Revolutionary War history, you know. I really enjoyed it so much. But anyway, it was a, a year. Now these girls were so, so smart. You know, so they always had a sense of humor. And that made it kind of more comfortable, you know. And this one fellow had the, the uh, most patents of capital. He was, he was Bob, you know, Bob Luce. 
And uh, so as he was retiring about the same time I was, 1980, and uh, I said, why don't you, uh, here, I, I read a book, a book on backgammon. Backgammon is 5,000 years old. 3,000 years before Jesus Christ, they were playing backgammon in the Middle East. And the British archaeologists came, have a backgammon board in the Museum of England from the Garden of Abraham. So this is factual. 5,000 years. Now this game must have something like this. It's 5,000 years old. Quiet, please. And anyway, the, uh, <laughs> so I, I picked that game up. Mm -hmm. But uh, Mrs. Hoagie used to play bridge with her friends. You remember her friends? And, uh, uh, but she, I said, play this game. So she did. So she, she played it, and we played it morning, afternoon, any old, any time. We were traveling to Florida, and we were playing the way. So this Bob Luce one time, this is a smart, he could tell you why two and two does not make four and make you believe it. And uh, so we're playing back there. We're over, table's over here, the counter's over here, and Sheila, my wife, is over here. So we're playing. Now, one, at one point, he is, he's calculating the law of Graham's theorem of specific probability. Which should be the right move? Do this, do this, do this. And Marty on the other side, he goes, Come on, Bob! It's all common sense! <laughs> he, I never saw him again. You know, you were talking about his intelligence. And you probably know the people that think they're so damn smart, but they're, they're very sensitive. And so, you knew this guy too, did you? You said he was full of beans. But anyway, uh, so after that, uh, well, of course, with Capital, I still enjoyed that very much. So, and then we have our veterans fees. <laughs> what else do you want to know? Well, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, what Saratoga was like, uh, you know, back in the 1930s. You know. <laughs> the horse racing and the gambling. Well, Byron Lansky was the little bit. There's a very good book out uh, of uh, Recently, it's been helped quite a while. The little man, but Meyer Lansky. Now he was the key man in gambling. And he started really in Las, Las Vegas here, but Las Vegas. And then he was in Florida too. A lot of gambling going on down there. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and of course, in Saratoga. Every dining room, every uh, hotel has slot machines. Every, every, every gambling was just as part of Saratoga. Congress Street, brothels and gambling things, and Arrowhead, Riley's, all of the, the, the gambling houses, Pipey Rock, beautiful Pipey Rock was very nice, and ballet service, and a lot of entertainers, Crosby and all the rest of them. So it was really, really quite nice. Quite nice. I kind of enjoyed it. And, uh, but uh, it was, uh, we're not really good because it, gambling was so excessive, you know. Mm -hmm. And then we had a governor, Dewey, and he wanted to uh, close down this stuff. In 1947, uh, he just about did. I know Judge Sweeney was, see, there were two men in Saratoga that ran Saratoga. Dr. Leonard was a Democrat, and Jim Larry was a Republican. Jim Larry controlled everything from Albany to the Canadian border. He was the man that ran. Those two guys ran. Dr. Leonard controlled the police force, and, and Jim Larry was a Republican who controlled the sheriff. Now, if the sheriff didn't get paid off, the Larry had or whatever the big guy, he closed it down after 24 hours. And then if Dr. Leonard, some of the he didn't get his cut, he would close them down. So that, that's how they operated. They had to get paid off. These guys got paid off big, big money. But Dr. Leonard and Dr. and Judge of Larry. And that was Saratoga. It was a, and everybody worked. Mm -hmm. Well, my friend, one guy in Cheesy Gorge, he shot his shoes on Philo Street there, down to Broadway. Another good friend of mine's father was a dentist, and on foot, he delivered newspapers. 
And I got a job working at the, the Day Hotel. I was a bellhop. Went to work at 9 o'clock at night and uh, till 6 in the morning. And of course, the banks, if they, if they bring the money, they close at 4 o'clock in the morning. And if, you, if the barrel, if they're coming in, they couldn't get into the bank, they, they pulled up in front of the, a lot of our place at the Fifth Day Motel, and the guy, the touring car, opened up the back door. The guy sitting there with a shove machine gun, <laughs> and uh, two guys got one guy in there, into the porch up there, and the other guy, and he had the, cut obviously, guns. And then the second car pulls up behind them, and the uh, guy hops out, he got a package under his arm, and they get up, they go behind the counter. George Bolster, the bank clerk, the rep, they have that time. They get down on the floor, and they count the money, then put it back in the, in the newspaper again, paper, and then put it in our safe, and in the morning they would take it to the bank. And then my part of the action started. I have all the racing forums and all the rest of the, to these guys, and I take them up to the room, and they give me a $5 tip. That was a good tip. Yeah. <laughs> and at the end of the meet, uh, you know, at the end of July, the, the Mr. I had to go see Flanagan. That was Bill Oh, and Mr. Flanagan. And uh, he said, Leo, how did you do? I said, oh, very well. He knew I did very well. So he gave me $12 for working the month of August. $12. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Flanagan. But, uh, but that was an interesting time. Because you meet such interesting people, too. These gamblers are tough people. And one time, the, the desk, the, I shouldn't move it probably. Not. But anyway, the, the, the desk where George, George Bolson where it goes over here, and then you come over this way, and there's a staircase, and then the elevator is over, over there. So people would be coming. Now, underneath the staircase, there were three slot machines. I think there are, uh, anyway, uh, three slot machine. And uh, so one, one night, uh, people would come in, and I was taking them up to the roof of the third floor. And when I came down, the slot machines were gone. Hey, George, we had to call the police. Don't call the little police. Call Small Dome and Shepard out. Okay, we call Small Dome. And his men come over. These are the guys that run the slots. Mm -hmm. And they came over and they found the, the slot machines, but they were all broken over with a hammer. Mm -hmm. and they were, the bunny was gone. So that was a little surprising interest. <laughs> <laughs> so that's part of the gambling part of it. Now, did the, uh, the horse racing and the casinos, I, I mean, did they conflict with each other or everybody coexisted peacefully? Everybody coexisted. The middle of, let's say, three o'clock in the morning in Broadway, Quinn's coffee shop was open, going full of people in the streets there. Horses, 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 horses. Everyone gave me so mm -hmm. horse racing. Horse racing was really important to Saratoga. I went back many years. But, uh, How did you get interested in horse racing? I know you Well, my you told father, when he was working at Skidmore, he bought a house at 113 Lincoln Avenue. Mm -hmm. When I was one year old, I link it at Now, the, in the end of July, they would walk the horses. They, they, had, they, had, they, had, they would walk, walk the horses from the freight station up Lincoln Avenue to the racetrack. And in the end of July, kids on the street, oh man, the horses are in town. And there was a retired jockey, Wade, Spider Wade, and he had about some eight kids. And we would all be all excited about the horses. And then up on, on East a on Nelson Avenue, there was a red wooden fence, and the, the track was over there. See? And we would climb up on this fence to watch the horses come around the clubhouse turn. And, uh, and except it was for every once in a while, Pinkerton would come down, hey, you kids, drop off the gun. Hit the, he hit the fence up. And so we'd all drop off. And once he, well, we'd back up on the fence again. So that's horses, horses, horses. And he was Mike Sweeney. He went into the horses because he had a job working at the, at the jockey's room, or just outside the jock's room. There's a, a, he had a water fountain there, and he had a box with some coins in it. 
And so to get a cup of water to, to drink a tip, and then one trader came over, I said, kid, put some half dollars in that box. So Mike put some half dollars in, and of course then he was getting heavy money. His mother, he had so much money at the end of the, end of the day, you know, that his mother had to make extension on his pocket, because his pocket would be full of money. <laughs> this is Mike Shui, who became Supreme Court Judge, Court of Appeal, later <laughs> on. But anyway, that was like, so everybody worked, everybody connected with racing. So naturally, we have a good feeling for horses. Mm -hmm. So I, so that my introduction was there'll be two, two boxes of racetrack, horses, 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 and then when I went to medical school at the University of Louisville, Churchill Downs is just down the street away, and then Churchill Downs is down in Louisville. You get on an elevator and they, they, they talk horses, horses, no matter where you go in restaurants, everybody talks horses. And uh, so, uh, of course, in Saratoga, in those days, when you walked out, it's very sophisticated. We were kind of above, better than this other towns around town. So we had the racing and the social life on Broadway, and, and so we were always. I, I didn't feel that way, but the Saratogas were a little better people. You know, people, mm -hmm. people. It, was, it was kind of the, at the time I didn't realize it, but I still have thought back. When I went to Louisville, people were very pretty. You walked down the street, people you never knew, and they, they're talking. I mean, what is the YMCA? They have a lunch or something. The guy sitting next to me, he starts talking. Very friendly. So friendly. At one time, what impressed me was, uh, of course, when I was in the North South Park, I became medical director there. And that was a high point of my life, I guess. I've been there before mm -hmm. because of these people that I was meeting. But the nuclear submarines had to go into Charleston quite often, and there was a problem down there, so I got involved going down there. And uh, the Naval Hospital was a beautiful hospital, really, really nice. And the people in South Carolina, they speak softly and nice, uh, different than New York or any place like that. So I thought maybe I'd like to live down there. Now when I was in medical school, there was a fellow by the name of John Price, sat next to me, and the reason I remember him I, I write my notes longhand, and he would write it, we'd print them, and he could, he could take notes as fast as I could, but he printed the letters out, you know. But I have to remember the Jack Price. Now, when we graduated, we, I, I joined the Navy, he joined the Navy, too. He stayed in and became a, a, a orthopedic surgeon, and he had been stationed in Charleston at one time. So I uh, called him. He happened to be living in, in California at the time. I said, uh, John, uh, what do you, I'm thinking about moving to Charleston. And he said, uh, you know, if you weren't born down here, you'd never be accepted. So uh, that was good advice, so I, I didn't move it. Maybe just as well, because here I am in Florida doing very well here, up here. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's the story of uh, how I ended up in Saratoga. I was born in Saratoga and I'm back here in Saratoga again. Yeah. Now, when you retired from the Navy Reserve, what rank were you? A lieutenant. I, I have a very strong feeling with the Marines. Mm -hmm. Because the ship that I was on, we had a compartment. There were 42 Marines in there. And when every once in a while, when they had an opportunity, they were working with their guns. So they, they worked with guns. And I got a gun. And, uh, and they would have a guy go up with a bow. I just a group where we were not in a war zone. And had some of the some of these number ten vegetable can big to throw them up to the bow. And the Marines are all on the spearing down here and they shoot the, the cans as they can buy. And I'm there with my forty five man. I can hit those cans just as they do. Hey Doc, you should be a Marine. <laughs> Semper five dollars. Semper five dollars. I have a Semper five dollars at home. I stick it on my garage. But uh, I get along very good with them. So I never had any. So sometimes there was friction between the Marines and the mm -hmm. sailors. Yeah. Now, did you stay in contact with any of the people you had been in the service with during World War II? Oh, sure. 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 Uh, over the years. But of course, a lot of my good friends are on the English 
out of a vein of shell. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did uh, did your ship have any sort of reunions over the years? Oh yeah, reunion. I'm a USS Atlanta. I got re I attend the reunions. I got mm -hmm. a cap for the reunion. Mm -hmm. Did you join any veterans organizations? Well, I was mainly involved with the North Town and Port Lamb. And here's the most interesting people in my life. Mm -hmm. Because they're clever, smart, and I had I got had a good relationship with them. And uh, to show you what there's one fellow, clever, clever guy. These guys were so clever. But he he had multiple interests. He would come down and borrow my Gray's Anatomy and the best in tailored physiology books books are that thick. And he would read these things at the time. Now that's not his field, so like radiation is his field. But uh, he had interest in many other things. And uh, so it's, they were, they didn't limit themselves too much. Mm -hmm. They were great, great, great people. That was a high point. Admiral Rickover, Father Duke of Summary, these guys were all clever. And to this day, some of my best friends there. Mm -hmm. Okay. But they're gradually dying off. And of course, I'm 96 now, so I'm next, the next to go. <coughs> I hope to stay around for a little while. Well, we hope so too. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Now, uh, you and your wife, you raised a family? Yes. We had one boy, named Scott. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm Navy. My wife was Navy. And Scott, of course, was Navy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was stationed in the Bahamas. He was trained in the Key West and then was in station in the Bahamas. In the Bahamas, now in the Atlantic Ocean, there are so, this is the program, Sosis program. There are buoys throughout the Atlantic Ocean, it's called in the Pacific. But anyway, and down in the Bahamas, they could read, uh, every ship has a signature. As a ship came out of Gibraltar, the state of Gibraltar, they could read that and identify the ship on a special screen. That was his job. It was an interesting time. Uh, he could pick up the list of identifying ships. Thing. And after he was there for two years, they took up a name, then he'd go to another thing. And he was stationed at Cape Hatteras. Were you living in Cape Well, what? Because in the meantime, he got married. And uh, he had Ian and the rest of it. But anyway, now, then he was stationed in Cape Hatteras for a while, and two years. And then he was at ADAC halfway between Alaska and Siberia, reading the Russian submarines and reading the, their ships. That was his field, see. And then, of course, he had these children here. And then, of course, in the top part of the day, your way is rougher than that, and the wire. Mm -hmm. You know, she's on her own. And it turned out that these kids, she and her, her brother, were put into a foster home. Now, there was one foster home, and then something happened. They were another foster home. And then there were the Lutheran minister and his wife with foster home. And they wanted to adopt these kids. They were four and five years old, but the mother wouldn't adopt. But, so, but then he was being transferred from Tennessee to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, from Indiana to Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And you could not take foster children across the state line. Mm -hmm. So these children go into another foster home. Hey, what the hell's going on here, Marty? Let's go down and find out. So uh, I took some time off in the lab, which I was medical director of at the time, and uh, we drove down there and we met her mother, her lawyer, and her mother in the. In the in, and I said, uh, we, all we want to do, it, these two little kids, blind, blue eyed, you know, really. Like new pennies. Gee, we <laughs> cried a lot. So, you know, and we don't want to steal these kids. We just want to give them a break. So they disappeared in the room with their lawyer. Finally came back and said, uh, Well, okay. Uh, it's okay. So then we went before the judge, and the judge agreed that we could have him as a guardian, not an adoption, but as a guardian. We could take him. We don't, she like she's from UK. Uh, maybe we'll take him to the UK sometime. Yeah, you can do that. So that was agreeable. Mm -hmm. So now I had been living in a big house, 124, 29 Circus Street, in Jamal Mansion. But I had sold that place, and now we're living at a little place on Saratoga Lake. 
and uh, but it worked out all right. We had three bedrooms there, and uh, we had a little bathtub about so big, and they, Mrs. Hogan put this one and her brother into the bathtub and washed both of them at the same time. <laughs> so that's where they were taken by taken care of, huh. and she would see they were clothed properly, fed properly, and because I was out to go, I tried the West Coast. That's where we got the making the bombs out there, back and forth, you know. So in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, it's been a lot of time down there, too. But anyway, and as the years went along, uh, oh, that's, what more do you want to know? <laughs> um, is there anything else? Uh, any any questions you'd like to ask your grandfather? No, she's the answer. <laughs> how, how about Grandma's family and her parents and her oh, grandparents? Yeah, yeah I, that's that's I don't think she's interested in that. Um, no, that's fine, that's fine. Well, uh, Mrs. Hoagie's uh, grandfather was Grandpa Straker, and I didn't realize he was so important until uh, my, my wife's, my brother sent me a statue of him and, and a picture to the Prime Minister of Atlee. So he was into, really into politics, and he was a member of the British Arts or something or other. But anyway, he wore the short pants, you know. Had to be a peer before the queen and all that, all that royalty stuff. So that was uh, the Scots are very proud people. Mm -hmm. Strager was really Strager was their name, and Strager uh, must be the originally way way back. Those were the Vikings, really. I think. The Vikings had been to America even before the Romans, but I think. Straker was a Viking, I believe. So, but I don't know. I know details on that. You mentioned uh, you had done some uh, sailing too. Well, that's a big uh, part of my life. Because mm -hmm. uh, I sailed in Sector of Lake, but ocean sailing is what really appealed to me. And I got to know uh, John Fritz. Now, his father came from Austria. Came to Chicago, started a bus line, and they eventually purchased uh, taxis. And so they had money, and John had money. And he had a beautiful boat, set the tank on the road, 72 foot yacht. Mm -hmm. And I crewed on that through a friend of mine who said, knew that I was interested in sailing. And so uh, I met John down in Florida, and uh, I told him my experience. I had sailed off. Cape Cod, a place on the coast, little, but nothing like with the, the tide. And then there was a transatlantic race coming up <clears throat> from Havana, Cuba to San Sebastian, Spain. And because that took a little bit of preparation. Uh, was, you know, your food had to be stored down at the bills. And we had a good crew, a guy from Halifax, it was a uh, he was a good and he was good with his rope work. And he could actually wire, he could splice wire and all that stuff, which was really good. And, and uh, it was an interesting group that was in there. And mainly, we were mainly sea bombs. You know, mm -hmm. These guys just, just sailed this boat and sailed that boat. And that's probably just what I did. But I stayed with, it, with the tie, it was great. So this big one, this is the big race. That was really a big, big race in my life. We could have sailed out of it races off Bermuda races and to, to South America. We did a lot of, but this was the big one. Five thousand miles from Havana to San Sebastian, Spain. You're gonna go into the Bay of Biscay and San Sebastian way over in there. So it took us over twenty days to get there and do that. But when you go out, you have to be uh, the Florida dri uh, drift is uh, Gulf Stream is about four knots. And you like to be in that because that gives you a bit of a lift. And a sailboat, everything like that helps you get along. And uh, so we were going along. There were six ships in this race. And uh, we got about well, off Cape Hatteras. And then one of the ships started taking out their garbage. That's on the bottom, opened up. They were taking out water. So they did that without she. They were out of the race. But we kept going and uh, crossed the Atlantic. And you know, for 20 days at sea, mm. 
Some I could that must have been awful boring. Out there in a boat for 20 days, but it was far from boring because the weather's constantly changed. In the morning, you see the sun coming up. You know, oh, beautiful. And you see the curvature of the earth, and at night, the shooting stars. And in the morning, uh, there'd be flying fish all over the deck. You had to clear the, slow them over. Once in a while, there was one guy who was supposed to be the cook. He would, uh, he would fry up some fish. But they were pretty good, but very boring. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but it was rough, 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 rough. And this guy that did some of the cooking for us, I remember, he, the day was her, her before he had a tough time. And the galley was about from here to that table, and the bass came down in there, and he had to do all the food preparation down there. And there was always 10, 10 inches of water sloshing around in there. And his boat was going boom, 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 boom. And he just, he see me, oh man, we're never going to make it. <laughs> that, Doctor, that I'm, much. I, I'm going to stop for a minute. I'm going to have to change tapes. All right, uh, we're on take two. Go ahead. So I noticed that the Senator Lake was good for sailing, and they got a few people together. There was a people connected to the nearby, and uh, we formed the surgery yet in my house. And then eventually we had a little place over by Tateros, and they prepared a new film on Manny's Cove. And that's where they had their club in town. But it started in my house. Okay. Dan Kelly from Paulson Spa, he had been Technical duty, and then Butler was a and Terry Vince was his brother, and they had brothers. that was a fiberglass boat. And I had uh, these mesh from 18. Mm -hmm. And you still live on Saratoga Lake? No, still live on Saratoga Lake. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, anything else uh, you'd like to touch on? Maybe we, we've missed? Can you think of any more questions? How did you feel about the Germans and your, your outlook for the... How did I feel about what? Well, the Germans and uh, your, your, just your missions and your, your, your well, outlook on the war. What, what was going, kind of the philosophy back then? Well, I didn't have any... Uh, fear or well, whatever. Going to the, the beach that morning, I was a little concerned. Yeah, yeah. So, but you know, when you're young, you, you take all that stuff. You know, when you get older, it's more difficult. But when you're young, it's you mm -hmm. kind of part of growing up. Mm -hmm. And you always had a plan. I had a plan. I knew I was going to swim to the beach. <laughs> And were there literally like thousands of ships or hundreds of oh, ships and airplanes? Man, and boy, it was still night. We got underway. And planes would go over that way. All these uh, the amphibious boats, mm -hmm. little boats they are, were all going the same way. And they hit the beach. And, uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was exciting. Mm -hmm. But she said, do I have a feeling against the Germans? Well, no, I really didn't. Uh, it was just that they, they were the enemy. We were shooting them. At one time, we were pulling off. We got all our casualties aboard. We were pulling off. All of a sudden, we get a message, stand by. So we had to stop. And uh, finally, they pulled one of those L LCVPs. It's an open boat. You could probably see it. LCVP, there were probably about 24, 25 German sailors in there. Now we're on our, we're, we're on our, we're on our way to go back to England, but these guys came along. We got orders to stand by, take these German prisoners aboard. Mm -hmm. So to get them aboard now, we put a rope ladder over the side, and they had to climb up the rope ladder to get aboard. And these guys, before they did that, 
Now, on a ship that's scuppered, you know, it's sources to be drained, drained, and they drained out to these holes in the ship. And these guys were going to clean themselves because they were going to clean and wash themselves from the scuffle of this trade war, or the dirt. But they were cleaning themselves, then they were fixing their hair, and when they came up on deck, they give us a salute, you know, thank goodness. And one, one little boy there, kind of, he was young, you know, and he just was pretty, he almost fell over. So I noticed that he had a wound in his leg, and uh, so I took him to one side, and uh, I cleaned the wound up. We did have salt in that one, but don't pay him so. Mm -hmm. Cleaned the wound out, irrigated it real well, you know, irrigated it from trusty guy to it, and gave him something for pain. And uh, he was so appreciative that when after he over it, he stood up to give me a salute, and he fainted, hit the deck. Mm. <laughs> they picked him up and took him out. But uh, the, the, I heard afterwards, the British for that uh, gave him such good care. But the Americans, we, we lost them. They're, they're human beings. Mm -hmm. and that's to answer your question, they're human beings. Now, of course, with the Japanese, I've been a little concerned about them. But as your brother said, after Pearl Harbor, they never apologize. <laughs> but he ends up by marrying a Japanese girl. So we're all very forgiving. And I understand. Anyway, there was a lot of Navy. Uh -huh. I was Navy, my son was Navy, Ian was Navy. And so. That's and I understand you've become a grandfather fairly recently. Yes, he's, he's, yeah. They said, what's your name? I said, Leo. Well, okay, now they named the baby I-L-E-E, -E, I Lee, Sheila. That's my wife's name, mm -hmm. Sheila. Okay. So it's I Lee. It's got a little Japanese twist to it, I Lee. Mm -hmm. Tokyo, or Yoko, Chico. All right. Well, thank you so much for your interview. It's been a, it's been a real honor. Oh, thank you. Okay.